My name is Jane, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County Juvenile Justice Team. We are recording this presentation. A sincere welcome and thanks to all of you for spending time with our special guest, Aaron Einhorn, to learn about kids excluded from classrooms and school buildings. We will hear from Aaron how unfair laws and the culture of punishment can harm children and families. And we remind viewers that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, grassroots, nonprofit dedicated to empowering everyone to fully participate in our democracy. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major policy public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League does not support or oppose any political party or any candidate. The League is an organization fully committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in principle and in practice. League programs like today's presentation do not necessarily represent League positions, but do provide a forum to educate citizens about American democracy. And a quick aside here, we would love for you to become a member of this JJ group. Today's educational presentation focuses on some of the harmful effects of youth discipline in our public schools. I'm pleased that Aaron Einhorn, a Detroit-based reporter, writer, editor, author, journalist, has agreed to spend an hour with us talking about her work investigating some of the harsh costs and consequences of school discipline, as well as alternative options for schools and communities. Also, a little more about our speaker, Erin is a 2023 Spencer Education Journalism Fellow at Columbia University and author who has worked for NBC News, Chalkbeat, New York Daily News, and more. While at NBC News, Aaron's work and collaborations won accolades from the Webbies, the Online News Association, and the Collier Prize for State Government Accountability, among others. At Chalkbeat, where Aaron was the founding editor of the nonprofit education news sites, Detroit Bureau. Her work was recognized in 2017 with the Education Writers Association, Pres <clears throat> prestigious Ronald Moskovitz Prize for Outstanding Beat Recording. She won a second National Education Beat Recording Prize from Ed Writers in 2018 for work judges praised for its very lively writing and creative approach. Erin, we would like you to speak freely without interruption. We will have time later for Q&A and of course the chat. So now I'm pleased to turn the program over to Erin. Thank you, everyone. Hi, folks. Thanks for thanks for coming out for this. And, and I really appreciate you, uh, your interest in this subject. Uh, so I actually started this um, project about a year and a half ago, actually, maybe two years ago. When I was working on a story about, I was looking at, you know, whether suspensions or expulsions had gone up since since the pandemic and kids were just starting to come back. And, and I was actually connected. I see I see Perry Stone Palmquist on this call. She connected me with one of her clients who was a 10-year-old boy who was attending a charter school near Detroit when he was being picked on by a couple of bullies uh, who threatened to beat him up at recess. He was a fifth grader. And he's like, well, I'm not, you know, he says, you're not going to beat me up at recess because I'm going to bring my scissors with me and, and protect myself. And so sure enough, at recess, the bullies come around and this this boy like takes his scissors out to scare off the bullies. And of course, they run and tell on him. And the school looks at the camera and there's a little boy with scissors, which the school decided was a weapon. And they expelled this boy from school for a year. And at the time that I that I talked to this boy's father, which was a couple months later, the dad had been trying to find another school that would take this child. Uh, <laughs> Blunt elementary scissors, yes, Perry added that little piece. Um, so the, the 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 they had the dad the dad was trying to find another school for this child. 
Um, and he couldn't because in Michigan, when you're expelled from one school for a weapons offense, you're essentially ex expelled from all of them. And he's calling, you know, we've got so much school choice in Michigan, but he's calling every single school that, that he can find and no school will take this boy. And he ended up back in a virtual school. And this was, of course, in the fall of 2021 when he just missed a year of school, uh, in-person school for COVID. And now he's got to go back for another year of virtual instruction at 10 years old. And I was rattled, frankly, rattled by this boy's story. And I was like, oh my God, you know, he made a bad decision bringing scissors to the playground and threatening other children. No one's going to dispute that, but he is a child. And to miss an entire year of school from that, it just seemed so wrong. And I'm like, what happens to kids after something like this happens? Um, and so I ended up, you know, setting out to interview other families all over the country whose children had experienced some form of harsh school discipline. And this was, at, uh, Jane mentioned the, the fellowship, I got this fellowship to, to do this research. And I posted this thing saying, you know, I want to talk to families who've experienced this. And honestly, I didn't expect to hear from very many people because of the stigma, right? Nobody wants to share how their kid got got punished at school and, and people are gonna judge their parenting, you know, oh, where were the parents, you know, why are they not teaching these kids? But it wasn't the case. I figured I'd talk to like five or 10 families, but in fact, I ended up being inundated. Dozens and dozens of families. I posted like one thing and a couple of listservs and I just, and, you know, and like emails and phone calls. Oh my God, thank you for telling my story. Nobody wants to hear my story. I've been shunned by my community. My child has been banished from school. Please tell my story. And I was like, whoa, there is something happening here. And so I ended up interviewing, I think I'm now up to like 55 or 56 families from 20 some different states. And these families are not a representative sample, but, you know, Black students, white students, you know, rich, one of the families I talked to was so wealthy that this woman's story at one point included sending her nanny to school to like watch her child, right? Help support her kid at school. And actually that same family was like in New York City. And then she's like, and then the pandemic hit. So we moved to our vacation home in Connecticut, right? So you got that family. And then you have all these other families whose parents lost their jobs because they got so many calls from schools to come get their kid that they couldn't keep a job and they were like scraping by on food stamps and, and public support, right? So wealthy, every race, uh, you know, every, you know, every part, all these different, you know, rural, urban, suburban. And they were all different stories in some ways, but they all kind of came back to this one fundamental thing, which is that these families felt like they didn't get a fair opportunity to plead their case at school. You know, and some of these kids had done absolutely nothing wrong. Some of them were wrongfully accused and had no way to prove their innocence. Some of them had made a mistake, like that little boy uh, at the charter school with the scissors, right? They, and, 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 but they felt like it was a minor thing. I had a kid who like lit a piece of toilet paper on fire over the bathroom and over the toilet and you know nothing happens when you light toilet paper it vanishes in the air, but this kid got a felony arson charge and was kicked out of school for four months. You know, and I mean, yeah, I was a kid who had like a toy plastic gun at his home. He wasn't, he didn't even have it at school, but like he used it to, he was pretending it was a real gun, which was bad judgment, but he was 12 years old. And it was, it was to a kid who was on his way home from school. So the school said it was in their jurisdiction and they, that kid's, you know, a year later, still not back in school. So I have these stories kind of all over the place. And all of these families had this common theme of we didn't get justice, right? The school once the school decided that they didn't want my kid, there was nothing I could do. It was, it was a, the decision got made. And after that, the entire infrastructure of the school essentially works together to get that kid out, right? We need evidence. Let's pull the kids out of class and pressure them to sign this witness statement, right? We, we you know, with these teachers, you know, you'll have a, uh, uh, you know, a, a hearing and everybody who's at the hearing, you know, the decider, the witnesses, the, the prosecutor, for lack of a better term, they all work for the school system and they all want to keep their jobs. And so they're all, I mean, even there's a separate process for kids with disabilities where it's the child's support team. But again, they're all working for the same principal who wants this kid out. And so they all felt like, you know, they didn't have a way to make their case. And so I, you know, so a, a few months back, I was like, well, okay, but you know, is that, are these schools just, you know, 
not, you know, I, I, you know, are these schools following these kids' rights? Is there, some, is there another way that this should be happening? Are these schools breaking the law? So I decided to go look at the law. There it is. Okay, so the fundamental law that uh, that governs what happens in school is a, is a federal co Supreme Court decision from 1975 called Goss v. Lopez, where the Supreme Court ruled that every child in a public school who is facing any kind of suspension or expulsion is entitled to due process. Next slide. Uh, oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so for a short, so short suspension, the court ruling finds that a student needs to be given these two things, written notice of the charges against him, and if he denies the written notice, um, he needs he, it, 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 written notice against him and an explanation of the evidence the authorities have. Okay, so and so so the question and then and then if it, if it's a longer suspension, next slide, uh, then it may require more something more more than rudimentary procedures are required. But what specifically does that mean? So there are 13,000 school districts in this country. Each of them has its own code of conduct that has been approved by its school board. Each of them has its own lawyer who's advising the school on what due process procedures that you know each child is entitled to. And so, you know, depending on where you live or whether you choose your traditional school or your charter school, that's going to depend on what rights you have. So some of the rights, so I went and did a, a survey of of schools all across the country, of school districts and, and states, and some of the laws, some of the rights that some districts guarantee and that some states require school districts to guarantee are these. Next slide. So you might have the right to timely notification. When will your hearing be? What could the punishment be? Um, you know, like, so the notice will say, okay, you're gonna have a hearing on this date. And in that hearing, you'll, you know, you, you might be facing suspension, you might be facing expulsion and, you know, you can bring a lawyer or whatever that right might be. It gives you the rest of your rights. They don't have to provide you with that. They have to provide some kind of notification, but sp the specifics of what that notification needs to say that's going to differ from district to district. Next slide. So you might have a right to be represented by an attorney or an advocate. So some states actually deny access at an expulsion hearing. So a kid could be kicked out of school forever and they show up with their lawyer. I talked to a lawyer in Alabama who, who said she was made to sit in the hallway during her client's hearing because, oh, the school district's lawyer wasn't available. That's usually the reason they don't let a lawyer come. They don't want you to have a lawyer if the school doesn't have a lawyer. And none of the state, I looked at, I did a 50 state policy survey and not a single state will cover the expense of a lawyer, right? So you even to have a lawyer, you have to be able to afford one. But even if you can afford one, your lawyer can't necessarily come in with you. Next slide. You might have a right to a timely hearing. So when do they have to hold the hearing? Can they hold, do they have to hold the hearing? I think technically uh, a lot of lawyers will interpret the law to say it has to be within 10 days, but, uh, or have to, but it, it often isn't. It could be 30 days later and 60 days later. So I talked to a young woman, an, a young, a sixth grade girl in Nevada who was, a, who was, who was facing expulsion for assaulting an administrator and it takes her two or three months to get a hearing. And when she finally gets a hearing, they testify, oh, it wasn't her who hit the administrator, it was somebody else. And they're like, okay, sorry, back to class. But meanwhile, she'd missed two or three months of school in sixth grade. And it was just simply, they just didn't hold the hearing in a timely way. So that was not a right that you, it's not a right you have in every state. The right to see the evidence being used against you, right? So it says in that, you know, in that court ruling that you are entitled to an explanation of the evidence that is not the same as the evidence itself. So I talked to a lot of families who said, oh, the school district told me they had video of my child doing this thing, but they wouldn't show me the video. Or they wouldn't show the video, the, the five minutes before the video, when you see the, the, like the reason the child was like doing, you know, they get in a fight, but the five minutes before a fight can be pretty important. Parents aren't allowed to see that necessarily. Next slide. See the evidence against you before the hearing. That's the thing. So maybe you can see the, the evidence at the hearing, but what if you want to see it ahead of time? and see who else is in the room. And maybe there's a witness who's gonna say something else. You, you know, I, I, I think, I think all, the vast majority of the cases of the families I talked to were not allowed to see the evidence of the hearing. So they show up at their, before they, they show up at their hearing and that's the first time they, they learn that there's a witness claiming that they did this thing. Next slide. 
so and then question and cross-examine witnesses. So the vast majority of these circumstances where the where they even got a hearing, they would show up with a with a witness statement, and the witness is identified as student A or student B for student privacy reasons. So now you've got a witness saying, well, you did this thing, but who's that witness? Is that the kid who's been picking on my kid for months? You know, so you don't know who, you don't know who that witness is, let alone, um, you know, whether that witness is telling the truth or the witness was just trying to get out of get out of being in the principal's office and was, you know, signed the statement so they could go back to class. Next one. The right to present your own evidence, right? So a lot of times the district will say, like, well, we're going to present our evidence. And if the parent says, well, can I show my evidence? They'll just say no. If you don't have that right, you don't necessarily get that right. Next one. And the oh, whoops, back, and then and then the, and then you have the right to appeal, right? So, if the if a lot of sometimes you can be suspended or expelled at the school level, the principal um, tells you you did this thing and you can't even appeal to the school board. Most districts will let you appeal to the school board, but most school boards are going to back up their people, right? Why do we have principals if we're not going to back them up? So for the most part, and then if you don't like the school board's ruling, in in a lot of states, including this one. You got nowhere to go. You have no place to appeal except the court system. So you can hire a lawyer. You could file a federal, you know, 14th Amendment case, say my civil rights were violated. And, you know, two years later, you might get some kind of ruling. But meanwhile, you know, your kid needs to be in school right now. Um, so if you're, yeah, so, uh, so yeah. And then, so, and, and then I, and then there's a, so I, so I went and did a 50 state policy survey to find out which states require districts to offer some or all of these rights. And in that, I actually found a handful of states that have even additional things beyond this. The next slide, these were some of the lights. If you're very lucky, you might have the right to compel or subpoena a witness, which is pretty extraordinary. So, cause a lot of times it's like, oh, well, you know, if you could just bring in this or, you know, this student, this student would, would show that I was innocent, but you know, you may not, the student, if they, if they decide not to come, they don't have to. Um, the right to an independent hearing officer or decider. So in a lot of districts, the person actually deciding this case is the principal, meaning the same person who says you did it in the first place. So you have the prosecutor and the judge being essentially the same person. But some states actually require it to be an independent body, and they define that in, in various ways. Um, Colorado just passed a law that requires training for these independent hearing officers, so they have to understand things like, you know, the adolescent brain and how it's not fully developed. Uh, the right to have your case decided only on hearsay. A couple of states ban the use of hearsay evidence, which would include witness statements that are written if the witness isn't there, and the right to have self-incriminating statements used. If so, can the district, if you, if a child does a thing, I had a couple of cases, there was a girl who like touched a fire alarm at her school, and then later that day, the fire alarm went off, and she said, oh, I wonder if it's because I touched the fire alarm. So she goes to the district, she goes to the principal and says, um, I touched the fire alarm. I hope that's not why the fire alarm went off. And they said, okay, here, write, write a statement down. And she sits down and she writes a statement. And then the district then uses that statement to uh, expel her for pulling the fire alarm, which she didn't do, even though her statement said, in the literally the only evidence they had, there was no video of her doing it. The only evidence they had was her statement. So in some states you cannot use a self-incriminating statement if the parent wasn't aware of it. Otherwise, schools, actually that kid I mentioned with the toilet paper and the arson, there was no evidence of his fire because it didn't, there wasn't really a fire. But somebody had smelled smoke and asked him, hey, what happened? And he said, oh, I lit a piece of toilet paper on fire because he didn't think it was that big a deal. And that's literally the only statement that the school had to expel him. And then they hand that over to the police. And that's the only evidence that the police have to file felony arson charges was a self-incriminating statement made by an 11 year old boy without his parents getting so much as a phone call to let them know that their child had been essentially interrogated. So next slide. So I, so then I, so I did, I went and looked at all the states and, and okay, how many states, that whole list of law, rules and rights, how many states have, I, I, I read the, 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 the laws in all 50 states looking for which are the states that require school districts to offer these, um, Offer, the, to offer these rights to students who are facing suspensions and expulsions. And the number of states that require every single one of those rights that I just showed you is, next slide, zero. <laughs> so the number of states that offered at least one of them is, 
Next slide. Uh, the next slide. 38. So there's 38 states. That, the one that was most common was the right to bring an attorney. So something like 38 states have at least you have a right to bring an attorney. And next slide. There are 12 states that do not offer that right. And those states include, next slide, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, you don't want to live in an A state, Arizona, Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, Nevada, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Utah, and Virginia. Um, so that, and so, and so, you know, this is sort of, we bring this back to Michigan. Michigan has, I think, 800 and something school districts, including charters, which means and the state has absolutely no oversight over what those districts are doing. The state has that, you know, doesn't even know how many students are suspended in each school because they don't collect that information. Uh, and the state has absolutely no idea. If you ask them, like, how many students are able to bring an attorney with them, the state doesn't know. Uh, you know, I, I talk to lawyers and, you know, they, you know, for the most part that it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. It has happened. Uh, so what happens to kids as a result of that? So I, um, Jane, do you have that video? So, cause this is, you know, this is all sort of like legal stuff, right? Like there's a law, there's not a law, but you know, uh, how many school districts are really depriving kids of these rights and you know, what happens to the kids as a result? Um, so I did this this project for NBC News, and I wrote a whole story, which would be difficult to read to you. But they, the, the, NBC, the, the team at NBC Nightly News, took the story that I wrote and turned it into a, a, a video thing. Um, and I think Jane's going to show the video. It's just a few minutes, and then we can take some questions. What were some of your goals? Uh, playing my senior year, having my dad and mom walk me out for senior game day, taking my mom yes. to prom. Dreams that were shattered last November when Corey Jones of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, was accused of bringing marijuana to campus after police say they found weed in a car he and four friends rode in. What has this process been like? Hell. You... Hell. CJ, who received special services in school for a learning disability, says he was called into the office and read his Miranda rights, which he told police he didn't understand. People are asking me, like, who is it? Who is it? Well, they saying it's yours. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know whose it is. Police investigated and charged someone else, not CJ, who had no prior disciplinary issues, his attorney says. But CJ says he spent nearly two months in in-school suspension before getting a disciplinary hearing, where his dad says CJ was given little chance to defend himself. Yeah. Were you all allowed to see the evidence against CJ? No, ma'am. Were you all allowed to challenge the statements made by his accusers? No, ma'am. Tuscaloosa City Schools then ordered CJ attend alternative school for 45 days. I mainly was mad. I cried in front of all of them. Cause I was hurt. An NBC News investigation found students' ability to defend against what can be life-altering punishments largely depends on where they live. Several states, including Nevada, Virginia, and Alabama, don't specify students' rights in state law, but rather give broad authority to school districts. Do you feel like you all got any due process? No, ma'am. Due process does not exist in the school system here in Alabama. CJ's parents hired an attorney, but district policy prohibited her from being inside the meeting where they tried to appeal his punishment. Charles Bell has spent more than a decade studying punishment in schools. We're literally pushing children out of school. More than 2.6 million students were expelled or suspended for the most recent year federal data is available. Black students were suspended at a rate more than double the national average, though experts say black kids don't misbehave more often. You have to leave. You're guilty. Oh. And we don't want to hear from you anymore. That's the thinking that we've created with allowing broad discretion and zero tolerance policies. Tuscaloosa City Schools declined NBC's request for an on-camera interview, but say their policies exceed due process requirements and that when students violate the code of conduct, they are given notice of the alleged violation, an explanation of the evidence supporting the violation, and an opportunity to respond. No one had the time to listen to them. You accept what we give you, that's it. You got the diploma. Mm -hmm. CJ's parents refused to send him to alternative school. I can see what I accomplished. Instead, he finished his senior year online. I'm thinking about the little kids that look like me. 
I got to fight like hell. I'm not going to stop. As CJ moves forward, his family continues to fight against what they see as a broken system. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So just a, and just another couple of details to add about CJ is that this kid is a is a star baseball player, right? So he was his plans for after after high school was to get a college scholarship and go play baseball in college. But this incident occurred at the end of the first semester. And he had to go to this, you know, he had to go to this uh, alternative school, which he didn't go to. And he transfers to this private online school, which he ends up getting a diploma from. So at least he graduates from high school, but he missed his senior season, right? He didn't get to play baseball in the senior season when he was hoping to show off his baseball skills. And I, there's another, if you read, I put, a, I dropped a link to that story in the chat. There's another uh, couple of athletes from a different high school in Alabama who I profile who were star, but they were both the stars of the basketball and football teams. And they were talking to recruiters and their plan after high school was to get a college, get an athletic scholarship and go to college, but they missed the basketball season. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it, the, you know, you miss a couple of couple months of school, it could mean the rest of your life. And so that's what's at stake. So I can take questions if anyone has any. <laughs> Um, hey, this is Perry um, from Student Advocacy Center. Um, my question is, what did you notice in states that had more due process protections kind of broadly? And then are there specific things that struck you um, about Michigan when you looked at the, all the 50 states? Were there, I mean, you mentioned the right to attorney was one that that struck you, but just wonder if there's other protections that sort of struck you that quite a few, or at least several others had that we did not have. So two questions. Yeah. So the, um, I mean, the, you know, so I was, I was at one point trying to find out like, okay, well, our suspension rates lower in states that have better due process. And I was looking particularly, so I, the, um, a couple of the Alabama students who I included in my story had been represented by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which also represents students in like seven other states. And so I was asking them actually, and they, their, their team that works in Alabama also works in Georgia. And Georgia actually has a pretty robust system, um, including a, a, a state level appeal. So if you don't like your school board's decision, you can appeal to the state board of education, which will review the decision and then issue a public um, opinion, right? Which then, so, cause I mean, one of the things that I, and I don't mean to demonize schools. I don't think schools are out to punish kids or out to, 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 you know, destroy kids' lives. I mean, schools, we, we all know what educators are up against. They've got all these kids coming in who have significant needs, right? There could be kids in your school with like real trauma, real problems. And our schools don't have the resources to help those kids and support them and prevent those behaviors. And this, this you know, and educators with thin budgets are really genuinely doing the best that they can. And so, you know, they're not going to, so, so, you know, and they, and they have lawyers, they rely on their lawyers to tell them what rights do they need to give to kids. Right. So, but in Georgia, so in Georgia, if you don't like what happened in your situation, you can appeal to the state ed, state board of ed, state board of ed will review it and issue an opinion. And so that opinion might say, well, you know, you have to show kids the evidence against them before the hearing. So after that, every school district in Georgia has to show kids the evidence before the hearing, right? So, I mean, if you look at the suspension rates and the expulsion rates in Georgia, they're not significantly different than Alabama because there's a culture of punishment in schools you know, everywhere, including, and maybe perhaps especially the South. Um, so, and, you know, and, and I was looking at like racial disparities, are the racial disparities worse in Alabama than Georgia? No, right? Because racial disparities are so rooted to just our culture of systemic racism and our history in this country. And, you know, black kids are, are gonna be targeted and singled out in Georgia schools, the same as Alabama schools. But when you are accused, right? and you do get a lawyer, right, then you have these various protections. At the school level, you might still end up, you know, getting kicked out of school, but at least you have this appeal, and at least the school has more information about, 
you know, so that the schools might be giving you more rights on the front end. So maybe you're, you're, you know, you have, you have a better chance of, of getting out of it. I mean, and, you know, and then there's the question of like, what percentage of kids who are suspended are wrongfully accused like that young man, you know, a lot of them may have done something, right? So the little boy with the scissors did in fact have scissors on the playground. That's the facts of that are not in dispute. And then there's the question of like, whether the school is required to consider that. So in Michigan, right, we 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 passed the state passed these these laws. You know, it says the school needs to there needs to consider seven factors before they expel a student, right? And one of those back factors is you have to consider the use of restorative practices instead of punishment, right? It doesn't say they have to use restorative practices. It says they have to consider restorative practices, but maybe if there were an an appeal system, perhaps. The, in the appellate system, they could ask the school district, well, did you consider it? What did that consideration look like, right? So maybe like, you know, Michigan passed this law that says, okay, consider seven factors, but how do we know if schools are considering the seven factors? You know, anecdotally, we hear lots of examples that like, well, they expelled my kid the day this incident happened. Of course, they didn't consider the seven factors, right? You know, kid gets in a fight. Here's video of the fight. Our policy is if you are in a fight, you get suspended or expelled or whatever it is, you know, and then the, and then the sort of that school system of justice just kind of kicks into, you know, uh, and then I think we did, was there, I, oh, and then the question about Michigan in particular, I think the, what makes the Michigan, what makes Michigan, you, I don't know what makes you, what, what, what makes things different in Michigan is sort of the, I mean, some states have laws that say, um, you must provide instruction to kids while they're suspended or expelled. Michigan doesn't have such laws, right? So in Michigan, if your kid gets expelled from school, it is your obligation to find that kid alternative educational instruction. And if your kid has, uh, if your kid is expelled, then no other school has to take them. So then you're just like, you know, maybe you can convince another district, oh, the thing my kid did wasn't that bad, please consider taking them, but maybe you can't. Uh, if they're suspended, you are at least entitled to come back to your home district, right? The district, your traditional school district where you live. Um, but if you, uh, if your home district was the one that kicked you out in the first place, uh, you know, if, you know, I live in Detroit. There, are half the schools in the city are charters. I should have unlimited options, right? But if my kid has a bunch of suspensions on his background, those charter schools aren't going to take my kid. If I want to use schools of choice and like, you know, drive to Ferndale, you know, and put my kid in the Ferndale schools, the Ferndale schools don't have to take my kid because I don't live in Ferndale. And if he's got a bunch of suspensions on his record, then they don't have to take him. So those are kind of things, you know, Michigan kind of, you know, the people who are big supporters of school choice talk about this as giving families options. And a suspension, whether or not that suspension was fair, takes away those options. You don't have them. They don't apply to kids who are difficult. And I will just add on a personal aside that I actually am the parent of a child who has struggled with some behavioral challenges and he was expelled from three preschools, which is kind of also how I got into this. Uh, and we were having a lot of problems last year at his school. And I actually went and he's got, he's got an IEP, he's got special needs. And so I went and actually toured a very expensive private school for kids with special needs and my kids got autism and ADHD and they were like okay great you know here's why we think your child will be successful here etc cetera, etc cetera. this is a school it's like a 30 something thousand dollar a year tuition and they said but just a note of caution we don't take behavior kids I'm like what do you mean by you don't take behavior kids she's like well you know if they if they if they engage in un, you know whatever behaviors they gotta go and I, and I was like, can you keep the tuition? Oh, well, yeah, you pay the tuition <laughs> up front. And I was like, well, if you don't take behavior kids, who does? And they didn't have that answer. And and the answer is, hmm? I mean, I, and I, I mean, I, you know, I think you can all imagine who takes behavior kids. Go ahead, Susan. First question I see in the chat is why should people who may not directly be affected care about the issues of school punishments and suspensions? I mean, these kids live in your community, right? Actually, I mean, you know, it's funny when I started this research, I was kind of like in my head, I was like, well, there's the kids who deserve to be expelled, right? And the kids who don't deserve, right? So like, and I was like, who would I consider, old me, a, a kid who deserves it? 
uh, like a kid who brings a knife to school, right? But so I interviewed this family actually in Western, another Michigan story. This was like Western Michigan. I can't remember what town. And it was this young man who had a history of post-traumatic stress. He'd been, he'd had some really difficult things in his young childhood. And now he's in high school. And this was a couple of years ago, right after the Oxford shooting, uh, which, you know, was, was a rattling event for, for all of us. And so this young man says, well, okay, I'm going to, um, he's, he's terrified that a school shooter will come to his school and he wants to be ready. So he brings a knife to school and it's a long knife and he hides it in his book bag and he has it just in case a school shooter comes and he's chatting with his classmates. Oh, what are we going to do when the school shooter gets here? You know, how are we going to be prepared? And he's like, well, I'm ready. I have my knife. And one of his friends tells the administration, the administration comes to him and says, well, do you have a knife? And he says, yeah, here it is. I'm ready for the school shooter. And the school's like, well, you're expelled. Right. And so I would have thought like old me would have been like, oh, okay, well, yeah, he brought a knife to school. Like he should be expelled. Right. But then I'm on the phone with this young man's mother and the young man's mother is weeping and saying, okay, my son has been expelled from school. And this was like a, he was old enough. He was like 17. He didn't, he, there was no obligation for him to go. And he moves in with his dad who has a house full of, of weapons, guns and knives. And he's in this house and he's playing violent video games all day long and watching porn. And he's angry. He's really mad that his school threw him out. So he's sitting in he's sitting in a house full of weapons, angry at his school, watching violent video games, right? So this child has been expelled, and you understand why the school expelled him, right? That principal doesn't want to be sued like the Oxford principal was, right? I got to make sure this kid is not in my school. He is out, and this mother is on the phone crying, and saying my child wasn't a threat to anyone when he brought that knife to school. He was he had it to protect his classmates. Now my child is a threat, so. That expulsion, if that child, God forbid, something that child were to get angry and take one of his father's weapons and, and go into that school and kill other children, the expulsion in his mother's mind would be the reason. So I don't even know what question I was answering. I can't really go in there, but it's yeah. like, you know, so the question is like, what are we doing for these kids, right? If a kid, clearly a kid is bringing a knife to school who has a history of trauma is a kid who really needs some help but they're not getting it by being banished and sent home, right? And I mean, and then, it, you know, if you're talking about more minor things like a regular ordinary school fight or like other kinds of things, the question is, does that suspension work? And I've been interviewing lots of teachers and I talk to teachers and I say, well, do you find that when kids come back from a suspension, the behavior changes? Teacher says, no, of course not. Do you find that it's a deterrent? Like, is it, oh, well, I might get suspended. Like, so therefore I'm not gonna behave badly. Well, no, a lot of kids love suspensions. They get to go home and play video games and like, they don't have to, they don't like school. So getting not, and then, you know, what happens when you go to, you know, if you're at school, you get two or three meals a day. You have like teachers you might not like, you may not feel supported at school. It may not be the best school environment, but what's going on at home? Is home a safe environment? Is there food, nutritious food at home? You know, what, you know, are mo is mom and dad or grandma or whoever you live with, are they there to take care of you on that day? Anyway, I forgot whatever the question was. I hope I answered it. <laughs> okay, there there are a few more. Let, uh, Susan Randall asks, are statistics on school suspension expulsion reported in Michigan? If yes, who reported, who report, well, I guess who reports them and is this available? Uh, expulsions are available. If you go to the, the state, the website, um, you can see, um, you can see how you can see the expulsion. You can see the expulsions in every school in the state. Um, suspensions are a little bit more complicated. So the state says they only collect suspensions related to um, kids with special needs, which is what they're required to do by law. Uh, there is a federal data collection called the Civil Rights Data Collection that's by the federal uh, the Office of Civil Rights of the Education Department. They publish um, federally. Um, data. And in fact, there's a ProPublica built a tool uh, that makes it, I forget what the tool is called, but they built a tool that makes it easier to look up schools, but it hasn't been updated since the 2017-18 school year. So it, I don't know how relevant that is. We've had a whole pandemic since then. But it, it is very difficult to, to see su suspensions in Michigan. You can't, you really can't. Expulsions we can see and and they're, they're up. So we were looking, we, and we had a prep call for this the other day and, and we looked at that and, and, and the expulsions are, yeah, <laughs> the expulsions are way, are, are certainly up per 
the number of students has gone down, but the number of expulsions has gone up. And if you look at the reasons, this is, a, this is another fun fact, right? The number one reason that kids are expelled in Michigan isn't violence, isn't weapons, it's other, which could be just about anything. And it really speaks to how much discretion school have. And you can see there's kids getting expelled in this state for alcohol, for tobacco, um, for fights that don't in, that don't have don't you know, a major category is fights where there's no injury, fights with no injury they're getting suspended, getting expelled for that expelled. Uh, so we have a few more questions. So let's ask this question here from Christy. Kennedy. What steps or actions would you recommend to address and uh, rectify these issues in schools? Uh, and I can't see the word here. I'll protect the well-being of students. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, advocate a particular policy stance, but I will say that your whatever school district you live in or whatever school your child attends or the children you love attend, usually the code of conduct is posted online. And if you pull up the code of conduct, you can see what rights they're guaranteeing kids who are who are accused and you can ask for the statistics in your particular district, ask for you know them broken down by race, are they being distributed equitably? Um, you know, in terms of whether or not, you know, some kind of state level policy change is required, that's really not my that's not my lane. Um, so I will stay out of that one. But you know, some states have taken um, efforts to change things at policy. And I mean, there's also simple things like you can have all the rights in the world. But if you don't have an attorney to inform you of those rights or to enforce those rights, it's irrelevant, right? Because, you know, even in this, oh, there was a question earlier about like what happens in states that have these great laws. And I think it does help if you also have a lawyer, but um, very, you know, I, I actually tried to collect data. I, I, I sent FOIA requests to lots of school districts asking for the percentage of students who were represented by an attorney in a disciplinary hearing. It's not a data point that any school district keeps. But anecdotally, it's a tiny fraction of students have any kind of advocate or lawyer or representative. You know, most families are told, oh, this is just a meeting for us to come together and talk about what's going to happen with your child. You don't need to bring a lawyer. And families believe them. And because it, you know, it does happen, you know, it often happens quickly. And they don't, they don't, and they don't realize that their kid is going to actually face expulsion. They're like, oh, my kid, you know, you get summoned to a meeting at school, you go to the meeting at school. That's what parents do. And you don't think, oh gosh, do I need a lawyer? Or do I need to record this hearing, right? Schools don't necessarily have to record the hearing at all. And if you wanted to hear, you want a recording of it later, there may not be one. And so the school then writes the chronology about what happens. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I would say, yeah, read your code of conduct. There's like different organizations that kind of tell you how to read it, you know, that, yeah. So great. Um Okay, Patricia Davis has a question in the chat. I'm a grandmother raising my granddaughter. She attended a charter school. I removed her from this school in 2019. I was called to come pick her up one day only to get her there, only to get there and she was in a chair in a mental jacket. I was pissed. She had severe issues still from that trauma. What could I have done for the school actions. My thing was just to remove her from that environment. Yeah, I, I'm like, I have, I don't, I mean, that's just, I can't even, I can't even begin. And that's so, I'm so sorry that happened to your granddaughter, Patricia. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, and I don't even know if that's, um, I mean, I, I mean, schools can restrain students if they feel it's an imminent emergency. I'm not even sure the school necessarily broke a law. I mean, you could argue that that was a child abuse and that would be against the law. Um, you know, I, start, I don't know. I mean, that's one of those things like, do you have an attorney who can advise you? And I'm not an attorney. I don't know what, what you could do. I don't know if anyone else on this call has insight on that. I hate to not be able to provide a helpful answer. Kathy Kosabud would like a remark. Um, Expulsions are masked in Michigan by assignment to alternative schools. Could you comment on that? I mean, some districts have alternative schools. Um, some districts don't. Um, and alternative school can mean a lot of different things. I mean, oftentimes this, it's up to the family to find an alternative school to go to. And, you know, an alternative school is a pretty 
broad term that can mean a lot of things, right? Like, what if it were a therapeutic school where you could get intensive wraparound services and could get, you know, uh, therapy and, you know, like for kids who truly are a danger to, to their classmates, like, you know, kids who are just picking fights and being violent. But, you know, the question is, are we continuing to educate those children or are we just letting them sit at home and play video games, right? You know, are we getting them the help that they need? So, I, that, you know, if the alternative school were, doing real instruction with real certified teachers in their subject area and providing additional, you know, that's one, you know, the answer to that question is one thing you could argue, well, you know, is that, is that the least restrictive environment? And, you know, are we just going to be segregating kids because of behavior or whatever? Um, but a lot of alternative schools aren't that. A lot of alternative schools are the locked building that's next to the real building and they have like a lot of police officers there and they have computers and the kids are just doing online instruction in a in a in a dark room i mean some of the alternative schools kids i, I interviewed went to this was like in the south but they make the kids like wear military garb and do marching and calisthenics and like it's boot camp and they're trying to like cure them of their badness or something like that um, but yeah i mean i think it's actually the expulsions aren't necessarily mad i think in michigan the expulsions aren't masked necessarily by the alternative schools, but by our school choice system, right? Because of the stuff I was saying earlier, where if you have a ton of suspensions on your record, you don't have access to school choice. So you get a lot of, well, if your child is at school on Monday, he's going to be expelled. Maybe he shouldn't be here on Monday. And so by Monday, you find a charter school or you find and you go back to your district school or you find some other schools. So, you know, a lot of suspensions and expulsions are not on schools books or they're telling the parent, keep your child home. And the parent doesn't know that that's a suspension that's not being recorded. Um, or you got to pick your kid up every day at noon instead of going to the end of the, you know, so there's a lot of off the book suspensions. And like this virtual thing has been, is this sort of the new way that that happens, right? So it's not the alternative school anymore. Now it's the virtual school mm -hmm. and the virtual school, you know, may not be, you know, we, we all any of us who had children during the pandemic knows how successful making every kid go to virtual school can be for kids. And some kids it's great. Other, lot, I think the majority of kids it's not. Um, so it's like, okay, well, your kid's on virtual for the rest of the year. And then whether or not you get expelled, it's whether or not it has to do with whether or not the school district is paying for your virtual class. Sometimes it's like your kids got to go to virtual and you got to pay it because they're kicked out. And we don't, we're not, schools in Michigan are not obliged to educate a child during a suspension or expulsion unless they have special unless they have special needs wow is there anyone else who has a comment or a question or anyone are in our participant group yes susan unmute okay. yeah um aaron thank you so much this has been you know just so informative but what i want to know as a as a resident of michigan of washington county of ypsilanti um what can i do as a, as a tax paying resident to hold schools accountable for these actions? Is there anything that we can do, any action we can take apart from attending the school board meetings um, from which in Ypsilanti you can be barred if you talk too much, um, you know, what, what can we do? A any suggestions? I mean, again, that's not my lane. Oh, Perry wants to answer. Why don't we let Perry answer? Okay, Perry, any, Perry that's fine. Why to answer? Uh, this is a not uh, also a nonpartisan response, but I would just say stay connected to SAC. Um, we are working with Senator Irwin to get um, legislation reintroduced. Um, we've been working with, with Michigan Department of Education to more to like, add to what we had introduced previously. And I think, yeah, just stay in touch as we have actions at different school districts. Um, that we really want to be led by and centered by families. Um, yeah, well, and... I've read the laws and the law right now, the verb that's used is may, not shall. You know, like with restorative practices, the verb is may, it's yeah. not shall. So um, yeah, I mean, that that's on the state level and that's good. But I was just wondering if there's anything we can do on a local level. Well, uh, I mean, have you read your school district's code of conduct? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I mean, like, there are things that like you could, for example, like does the school district suspend kids for dress code violations or for like the way they wear their hair, right? Or, you know, what, and then how, I mean, like, I think like the drug policy is really interesting, right? If a kid 
you know, you can buy marijuana on every, you can't drive down the highway without seeing like 1500 marijuana ads, right? So all the kids are, they, you know, so now the kids are bringing weed to school and what's the school, you know, a lot of schools have a strict policy, you bring any kind of illicit substance, whether that's tack, tobacco or alcohol or marijuana to school, you're out. Right. But so you, you kick a kid out for using marijuana. What are they going to do when they get home? They're going to use marijuana. So it's like, are those kids who need um, support and do they need substance abuse counseling or like, what are you actually doing to discourage that behavior rather than just like, you know, yeah, I mean, you're not going to like if you're if you're a kid, you get a call that your kid brought weed to school, you're not going to be like happy about that. Right. But like you're going to try to figure out why is this kid doing that? And does this kid need some help other than just getting kicked out of school? So what is the what does this district do for different kinds of infractions? And does it seem like the right response to really with the goal being teaching children to learn? Children make mistakes. They screw up. They do really stupid things. We all do. Right. And like we can get fired and, you know, there could be lifelong consequences. But like these are children and should. And, you know, and if you, you know, in the day I wouldn't men I didn't mention this, but the data on suspension, even a short suspension, a kid who's had one short suspension is more likely to drop out of school than kids who never had a suspension. The biggest predictor predictor for a second suspension is the first suspension. Right. Once you've been suspended once, you're likely to be suspended again. You're likely to drop out yeah. of school. You're likely to that number is 10 times more likely to drop out of school, to hold negative attitudes about school, to end up in jail. So we know this is very, very, very serious. What an incredible hour, Erin. We are so privileged to have had you here. You are truly our power star. Thanks, Erin. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening.